Frontline is a presentation of the Documentary Consortium. Tonight on Frontline, the U.S. military is the most integrated institution in the country, and it runs the most intense race relations school in the world. The lady came out and said, they can go in, but you can't go, because I was a nigga, okay? Correspondent David Marinus tracks the students through a 16-week course as they confront each other with their racial anger and frustration. And we always go back to the past. What happened in the past? This happened back then. This happened back then. It's not what's happening today. It's, it's time to change. He's sitting here like he don't, he, he don't know that all this is going on in the world. And I don't understand that. All you got to do is look. It's there. It's happening. Look at the whole big picture. And if you can't see it, then you blind. Hold on a second. Tonight, a powerful journey across America's racial divide. The color of your skin. With funding provided by the financial support of viewers like you. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is Frontline. Patrick Air Force Base, Florida. It is January 16th, 1991, just hours before U.S. forces will launch the air war against Iraq. You're going to be going through some uh, experiences that you probably have never gone through before in your life. I want you to take some risk. This is the environment for it. Don't stop along the journey or take too long of a rest. Take the journey seriously. You're going to be asked time and time again, how do you feel? If you answer back, I feel nothing. You're dead. Uh, this afternoon, As the military gears up for battle half a world away, these troops embark on another mission. It will take them across the dangerous psychological terrain of their own fear and prejudice. Talk about when we look at discrimination, when it deals with people that are in that out group, then that's the kind of discrimination that's very painful. That's that part that keeps racism working all the time. And it's not Another semester begins at the leading race relations school in the United States. It's called DOMI, the Defense Equal Opportunity Management Institute. Come up with some stats. For 20 years, this school has trained officers and enlisted men and women to become equal opportunity advisors. We will. They are frontline troops in a struggle against discrimination. It is a struggle the military has not yet won, but is waging more diligently than any other institution in our society. Issues and problems. You focus in on the system. I think we've made a lot of progress in the military as, as an institution you know, over the last 20 years. I think part of that comes from the fact that we have a more captive audience in the military, and I think we can do things that are more directive in nature. Lieutenant Colonel Mickey Collins is the director of academics at the OMI and he was one of its first students. I do think that we have come a long way, you know, much faster than, than our counterparts in the corporate world or in civilian society in general. How do you explain that? Well, I think some people uh, back in the early 70s made a commitment to try to bring equal opportunity into the military as a way of life. That commitment was born out of necessity, desperation really, out of the war in Vietnam. For the first time in Vietnam, all black and white soldiers went to battle side by side in fully integrated units. But as the war began to sour and racial tensions exploded back home, black and white troops turned on each other 
in a bloody internal war. Yeah, what the hell you wait for? Okay, on the right place. Move. Report tonight that a fight involving black and white sailors broke out yesterday aboard the aircraft carrier Kitty Hawk, stationed one of the worst the racial Vietnam. disorders ever to take place on a military base in this country happened last night at Travis Air Force Base, north of San Francisco. In the States, training camps and air bases exploded in violent protest as black troops reacted to generations of unequal treatment. It's racism and, and uh, favoritism and the base commanders here, the base commanders everywhere, they don't compromise, they don't want to hear our rights because they got dogs and M16s and fire engines to come down here on us. I think what they should have done was when it all started the weekend, they should have called them in and wiped them out then. The sides are clearly drawn, and both expect more trouble. Military police at Travis remain in full combat gear. Bob Flick, NBC News, reporting. In September 1971, the Department of Defense opened its own race relations institute. Gene Johnson, a retired Air Force Chief Master Sergeant, was one of the original instructors. The mission then was to put out the fire. It was then, you know, we came in because the riots were going. It was to teach race relation education and to contain the riots so that we would have all of the people working together for the mission itself. And the mission was to be able to fly planes, or for the ships to move, tanks to go, and those kinds of things. And they still maintain their culture. More than 11,000 troops have trained at Diomi over the years. Well, really like the the course has expanded to include all forms of discrimination, including gender. But the military's most difficult task today, as it was two decades ago, is trying to bridge the gulf between white and black. What do you say about that? Race remains the most painful divide in American life. The reminders are everywhere, from police brutality in the streets of Los Angeles to bitter fights over quotas and affirmative action in the halls of Congress. Three years ago, I set out to see if there was any place in America where whites and blacks were dealing with each other honestly and on equal terms. Most often, I found the racial dialogue played out in different rooms, blacks in one, whites in another, talking mostly to themselves. And then I discovered this school. Here, finally, I found a place where blacks and whites sit together, listening to one another in the same room. It's not negative to me. Okay, okay. You're okay. Each day at Diomi, small interracial groups meet for several hours to discuss issues that nobody wants to talk about. For three months, in a room called the Fishbowl, we watched one of these groups, Group 1. Seven whites, six blacks, two Filipinos. I don't think it'll ever repeat itself, but smaller mistakes that we all Some volunteered for this course. Others got orders to attend. Uh, let's everybody know With the exception of the white upper middle class, a rare species in the volunteer force, Group 1 represents many of the voices of America in black and white, from Chicago to Utah to Alabama. I kind of got angry because of this, because I can't really trace mine all the way back as far as you can. I feel the pride because of it. One of the things that I thought once, once they said that was, after society would have started to change and during the reconstruction period how many of the families decided to leave what was considered the country now and migrate back to where they thought their possible origins were from so what you're saying is you think your feeling is that they should have went back to africa no i just was curious as to what the percentages were that decided well now we can do what we want to do, and I'll, would I want to be back with my original uh, culture? If I okay right now, say if I decide to go back to Africa and try to find somebody, how would I do it? I guess I come from Europe, but that's never been important. I'm American. That's something that's never been important to me. I don't, maybe I can't. Um, I, I can't identify with what he's saying. Uh, Sergeant Smith, I just wondered if the, part of the reason you can't relate to that be is because you've never experienced what a lot of other people have, you being a white person, you've never been oppressed, and you've never gone through any of this. Could that be part of the reason why you can't relate to it? I, I can understand it, but I can't identify with it. To me, it's not important where I came from. Naturally, I don't agree with slavery, and, and I can't say that I had my hand in the cookie jar. I, I didn't have anything to do with that back then. I had to live with the way 
society is now. Okay. Trainers lead the discussions and daily exercises inside the fishbowl. Other DOMI officials monitor the action from a lab room behind a two-way mirror. The group sessions seem like vital extemporaneous plays, yet they are carefully directed to balance confrontation with understanding. The small group is kind of the cement, I think, to what we do. You know, we can put them in the auditorium and, and give them all the academic, all the book knowledge in the world. But I think if we don't give them an, uh, an atmosphere where they can process all of that information and share their own experiences and their own ideas and their own feelings, I think we'd be wasting our time. Sunday, I was out washing my car and I was waxing a 65 year old retired Air Force guy. 26 years in the Air Force came up to me and said, um, started talking to me around in the morning. I wasn't talking, but he called my, he called me colored. Army Sergeant Eugene Bickley emerges early as the most forceful member of Group 1. Racism is not a new subject for him. He learned his first lessons 30 years ago in Alabama. He said, well, one of my best was I remember when I guess I was about eight or nine and I wanted to go to this carnival. My mother told me that uh, you can't go to it. and I couldn't understand why. You know, I, at that time, I didn't know the difference between black and white. I thought everybody was the same. And it really, it was really a shock to me when she said, I can't go and I want to know why. She said, well, you're black and it's, it's for whites. And you know, like, I still didn't understand it. You know, like she sat there and she tried to explain it to me. But as a kid, I wanted to go. I didn't understand there was no difference between black and white. I didn't know my skin color caused me not to be able to go someplace. And then you also know that black people were tagged with the slang name nigger. So if they were working like that... There are no taboo college, subjects for Group 1. Early on, they explore the ugly side of race and language. Have anybody ever heard the term nigger rig? Mm -hmm. They do that on automobiles. Yeah, I, I never heard it until I got to Hawaii. And it was I people first. out cutting grass, and then uh, <laughs> they came up in, in, in the company. This one dude said, well, we are a nigger rig, you know. <laughs> that was the first time I ever heard that. That's a real I heard Jerry rigging you know, but I never heard nigger rigging. That's real common. Take clothes, take clothes, hang a wire, tying up the muffler. Yeah, that's what he's doing. He had a long one. He's going to tie up the, um, one of the screws came out, so he was going to get out of the mill nuts. Nigger toes. Nigger toes. I had nigger heels. In college, so I went to military college, talk about this guy's from Savannah, he says, when y'all tie y'all's uh, ties, you know, don't tie those big nigger knots on your ties. Mm -hmm. uh, and he wasn't thinking about what he was saying, because he said it all the time. Mm -hmm. And there was, you know, we had about 10% black, so. Uh, <laughs> nothing go to it. Nothing go to it. Well, that, you know, something else, my, I talked to my daughter on the telephone, and she said, I miss you so much. And I said, why? She said, because Granny would keep putting nigger flats in my hair. Seven. What? Nigger blast. That's that. Cornrows, ain't they? Cornrows, they like cornrows. They're braids. A cornrow is flat to your to your head. They stick out. It could, but you can tuck it under. You know. And what's it called? A plaid. A plaid. It was all right for me to say it. I heard it said, but if he said it, he said it, it was a fight. I think Richard Pryor stopped using it. He used to use it constantly, all the time, throughout his act. And when he made his trip to Africa, he stopped using it. Because he learned a little bit more by himself. And he, and he stopped using it. Because he, he doesn't accept the time anymore. And, and, and I think that's, that's got a lot to do with it, as far as I'm concerned. Because it's got a lot to do with the fact that I don't use it. And I don't like to be around people that use it. I don't care who they are. During the last five years, Klan membership has nearly doubled. There are now an estimated 10,000 active Klan members in 22 states. And I looked at it and I was like real amazed. Tell me what you see right there, Professor Anderson. Whites. <laughs> well, are they white what? White yeah. male. Well, until you get down here, it's all white male. Okay, this is the Department of Defense. ...and the void. So as we look at it in the eyes from the book, The White Man's Burden, it states in that I'm giving them something that they have not known for years um, that's been distorted in a history book. I'm giving them research. I'm now in an environment 
where they're forced to learn, where they're forced to hear. Non-whites to blend in. It's not always easy being a white male at Diomi. Day after day, you keep hearing that you're a member of the most powerful club in America. way in which um, the white male club can resist change. We have I'm pretty much tired of hearing about the white male club. I had never heard of the, that term prior to coming to here. Sergeant Bob Hustleton joined the Army right out of high school. His roots are working class. Both his grandfathers bloodied their knuckles deep in the Pennsylvania coal mines. His motto, I don't owe anybody anything. It feels like because I am a, a member of, I guess, the Caucasian race, uh, and for whatever reason, I'm being stereotyped as a member of the white male club, and for some odd reason, I, I have this power. What are you trying to get at? What he's saying, saying is, is the majority sets the norm. He didn't norm. say majority. But that's what he means. He said white I think. society. He mean? just said strictly society. What is the majority? society's made up of all the majority? What is the majority? The majority right. set the rule. What is the majority in this country? I don't know. Tell me. White. White. And, and they're the only ones that have any say in society. Majority sets the rules. No. That's your, per, that's your perception. Then. That's the way it is. What you're saying is you're talking for every white in the United States right now. No. That's what it sounds like. No. I, and no one else has a voice in it in, in society. That's what I I'm saying. I think you're taking it on an saying. individual basis. No, I'm taking, it as, white majority as the, I'm taking the it as the white society. Yeah. White I don't have any say in it. Am I part system. of white society? Yep. And I'm in the majority of the society. How come I don't have a say? You do have a say. Can you be labeled as black? I'm sitting in a Can you be labeled as Hispanic? Can you be labeled as black? Can can you actually go if all files there and we went someplace and we said we got five <coughs> black guys here, right? Or five black no, people. No, naturally here. I can't say that I would be black when there's So different. what would you be considered then? What I'm As the debate unfolds, Sergeant Hustleton gives voice to the frustrations of many white males in the post-civil rights era. They say they're being stereotyped. They chafe at affirmative action and other social policies based on group rather than individual characteristics. For generations, white males used color to their benefit. Now, when they feel threatened, they argue the loudest for a colorblind society. It seems like to me that the perception uh, right now is, for, for, take me for example, I just happen to be white due to no, you know, I had nothing to do with that fact. So I wake up in the morning and I go to the mirror and I look and I says, gee, it's going to be a nice white day because I, I'm in the white society and I'm a member of a white male club and we run the show, so what can I do to exert my power on everyone that is not white? So uh, the white this, the white that. But then when we talk about whites, we're like, we don't even get tested on it because we're, I guess the white society is not important to learn anything about, but the rest of the societies are. Don't even get tested on that. We don't spend a half day on learning about white culture because, what, we don't have a culture? But everyone else has a culture. So what's... I think you missed something. I thought it was understood that we live in a white culture. We do? Yeah. Everything that happens, everything that I do, everything that you do, everywhere you go, center just around white culture. White society? I don't believe it. But you think all blacks feel this way? I don't know. Are you going to tell all the blacks that when you leave here, that what you learn? That they live in a white society? When a white person comes to you for an equal opportunity complaint, what's the first thing you can say? Uh, he's white society. Sorry about that. But if a minority comes in there as well, yeah, okay, sit down, have a seat, let me listen. It has to be something to do with the white. Is that what you're trying to say? That's what my perceptions are. No, that's, that. that's what my perceptions are coming from this course. I didn't make a comment on it. I just, I just, you know, I saw, I mean, like, I've, I've, I've noticed this about you each time this comes up, you know. You turn red, you know, yeah, with, it's, it's in order to withdraw, you say, I ain't got nothing to say. Yeah, if there's anything else coming. But at least this time you told me something besides nothing. It pisses me off. I feel like we have accomplished something today. Anytime the black and white subject comes up, I'm open, you know. I, I say whatever I feel, you know. But I don't think everybody's like that. And this is frustrating to me because I want to really know how people think about me. You know? I want you to be straight up front. Then I can deal with you better than I can if you're holding something back.
From the first day, Sergeant Hustleton has been Group One's most reluctant member. Race to him is not a social or institutional issue, but solely a personal one. He insists he's never had problems with blacks, so what's all the fuss about? I never was really given any specific guidance as to what to, what to think about different races. I uh, kind of like to make my own observations and, and determine what's good or bad in any situation. Uh, I've never had any problems with uh, or consider myself being a racist. I pretty much get along with with anyone. And defend with equal vigor the right to burn the flag as the right to wave it. If you want to prevent a flag from burning, do it with fire retardant chemicals and not with restrictive legislation which limits our rights and freedoms. What's the controversy over? Petty Officer Kelly Anderson is the closest thing Group 1 has to a white liberal. Yes. Anderson joined the Navy nine years ago to escape the coal mines of Huntington, Utah. He was the 15th of 18 children in a Mormon family. I have little patience with people who take for granted the Bill of Rights. Years ago, Anderson rejected Mormon doctrines that excluded and denigrated blacks. He's not always proud of the white male role in history. Typically in history shows that it's been the white males that have been doing all the oppression and, uh, and it's their power that's, and their prejudice that's the cause of the discrimination that's, that's occurred. I'm sometimes ashamed of what the white man has done to uh, the various groups. <laughs> Anderson tries to establish a rapport with black soldiers in Group 1, especially Sergeant Evelyn Johnson. Sergeant Johnson, an Army Corps reporter from South Carolina, also grew up in a large family, one of 15 children. She's always felt the impact of the color of her skin in the military and back home. When, when I was growing up, uh, my sisters and brothers thought that I was treated special because I was light. And, and my parents, I had every other sister and brother, one light, one's light and one's dark. And then just recently, one of them mentioned that, uh, you know, all the dark skinned ones quit school and went back and finished and all the light-skinned ones went straight through school. And um, it, it was kind of... When I first joined, I had a hard time adapting to the military because I felt like uh, I was always being discriminated against. And uh, people throughout my career said, you need to go to this school, you need this course, and you'll understand, it'll make you a better person. During an exercise in the first month, members of Group 1 choose the classmate they feel closest to. Anderson picks Johnson. Uh, speak to me as an equal, and that makes me feel appreciated. I see her as a very strong source of information and support. We think a lot alike, an awful lot alike. And we see things uh, most frequently the same. I feel closest to her. Johnson returns the compliment. I feel closest to you because you're easy going and easy to talk to. I feel good when we hold conversations about anything. I feel that you appreciate me as a person. I feel comfortable. I feel respected because you're honest and candid. Boy, that's love. <laughs> it's not just what happens in group that sets this school apart. How many other places in America do you see whites and blacks study together, relax together, and draw one another out? in settings where their cultures are shared and they meet as equals. I think people really get a good idea of um, how the cultures relate to each other and what the concerns of, of people that are different from them are. The more important things to me are those kind of informal social context where people can actually share. We don't do it socially in society in general. We do it more in the military, but we don't do it anywhere near as much as we should.
experience that blacks have done to whites. I know that there's certain places Some, I no, can't experience. go. Experience. Experience. There's places that I can't go. I know that for a fact. You experienced them? That's you went to those experience. places and they told you, a uh, black told you, you can't come in? I knew better than go there. Oh, you heard No, you did, heard. did, you, did anybody ever tell you that? I've been told, so I mean, you can't come here because you're a nigga. Well, I, huh? I, was told, I was told in a club in the Caribbean. I was playing basketball. This was in high school. I was playing basketball. I went to Clan Alabama. The whole basketball team. The lady came out and said, they can go in, but you can't go. I had a white coach. He said, well, none of my team will go. But I was told because I was a nigga, okay? And I can tell you right now, Coleman, Alabama, the same thing is still happening there. So I'm telling you from experience, this, this is stuff that happened to me. I'm not telling you nothing out of book. Somebody else told me. Now you tell me your experiences that black had done to you. I don't have it. That's what By the eighth before. week, group so one is storming, you releasing deeply about. embedded racial frustrations. The goal is to get it all out, one way or another. Has, has blacks ever there are some people that dump it all. You know, all that baggage they've been carrying around for their entire life, their whole experience. They get to the point where they feel comfortable and they just dump it. And, and then they're, they're through with it. And, they've, and it's like a big burden being, being lifted off their shoulders. Some of them, they drop it out in little bits. It's always what white did to black. That's Do you have a exactly. guilty conscience about it? No, I don't. But that's all I hear. Whites did this to is that, Could it be that's, that's all you choose to hear? Because other things are coming out of here. Let's talk organizations. We always talk about KKK, Aryan Nation, whatever. But aren't there black organizations that discriminate against whites? Are they out there? Do they exist? Yes. Why don't we ever learn about those? Have we ever learned about them? I've heard them mentioned once. One black organization mentioned once. It's not there. I count them. One black organization. They talked about Farrakhand and his, his group. That's okay. the only organization I have heard discussed that is... Sergeant Glenn Smith has now become much more active in Group 1. Smith grew up in the Deep South with negative feelings about blacks. I probably had the, uh, the obvious, you know, the, the obvious stereotypes that people have. Uh, you know, all blacks are lazy. All blacks, uh, you know, they don't work. They're all on welfare. They're all single mother families. And I'm, I'm sure I got a lot of them from TV. TV depicted, uh, as I was growing up, as I remember, TV depicted black people as being sort of ignorant and lazy. Sorry, Smith, did I not tell you I was a racist? I had stereotypes about what? Did I not tell you that? But well, you never I, told I, me I, what your stereotype was about blacks. I'm so I was hustling it. That's I, what I wanted I, to hear. I believe we have. I believe we've put them out on the floor. <laughs> I regret the fact that I didn't have to tell you up there what, what, what my stereotypes was and what I call whites. But I can tell you that. I'm a man up to tell you because I did. Well, I believe I, I but, did. But you never told me what I you said. said. I believe I said something. You told me the other day. You was close to me the other day when we sat on and you said, y'all, you call, you call a black a nigga and your parents whoop your butt. My but mom. you never said, you never said that in the class. You never, you never said that you had said nigga. You never told me that until we got on it. I don't know whether it was the group environment that bothered you. Now, I felt that, you know, at least we had got some camaraderie that you could tell me that, that you felt comfortable with me, but when we were in group, you, you never told me that. And I feel that, I feel the pride. When group it, one's search for common ground succumbs to a scramble for safe footing. And the debate now turns on fundamentally different perceptions of reality. One side looks to yesterday, history. The other points to today and progress. Exactly. Exactly. And we always go back to the past. What happened in the past? This happened back then. This happened back then. It's not what's happening today. Yes, because it's it time to change. Because that's important. It's happened to the day, Sergeant Smith. It, well, I understand we can learn, we can learn from history. Uh -huh. I understand that. It's happening. But it's changing right now. You know, we can talk change. We can talk change. I welcome change. I welcome change. And we can talk change every day. But when I go back to Alabama, go home, or go uh, uh, northern Florida, or uh, anywhere else, and I still see the same things, you know, that hurts. It's, it's a deep, deep feeling, and I can't come back in here. I mean, I come back here, and, and we talk about this thing, and you, you well, I don't want to attack nobody, but you can use it's being said that it's not happening. It's changed. It ain't changed. And if you think it's done changed, like I said a while ago, you need to go back and look again because it happened. 
But it's changing right now, and to say that the blacks were the only ones that are discriminated against is wrong. Nobody never said that the blacks were the only ones. That's what I hear. Nobody never said that. Whites did, I haven't heard anything about blacks doing this. See, see, this, 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 this is another point now. Sergeant Vernon Stevens, a no-nonsense drill instructor, is Smith's counterpoint in Group 1. They're like bookends of perception on issues of race. School desegregation was a formative event in their teenage years. Stevens in Alabama, Smith in Florida. I went to a school in Florida in the uh, mid-70s. There was a lot of racial tension in the hallways. There was a lot of talk coming down the hallways and in incidents, small incidents of people in fights one way or the other. Black against white, white against black. We kind of acted violently at something, but you know, I think, we, like I said, we were, we were expected to be like that way. Uh, they didn't want us to come to their school. They're, they're only going to tear it up or this, that, that, and the other anyway. And that's what, exactly what we did. We, we went in there, and uh, as soon as something was said that ticked us off or whatever, whatever, whatever happened, you know, we, we fulfilled their prophecy. I found as I grew older that that's really not the way of, of making change. Let's talk just the military. You don't think that there's been a change between now and 20 years from now? Somewhat. It's not as much as outspoken as it was then. <coughs> the most trouble. You could go into the bathroom. Well, we, they moved us in a, a brand new building in Vilsack, Sac, Germany. Our whole battalion was in a brand new building. It wasn't a week that went by that you couldn't go in not one latrine and see some kind of white racist uh, 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 graffiti. Uh, graffiti on the wall. Wait, wait, so that's telling me this is in Germany today. But could oh, you go to your command? Today. Today. The 1970s. Of course, of course we went to our black soldiers. soldiers. You, didn't feel like you, know, you know what we did? You know what we had to do? We, you know what we had to do after, after we cleaned, cleaned the wall? We had to put guards on the latrine. This is happening today. Reality, you know. And um, See, who's reality? Your reality or my reality? Life. I'm telling you what's happening. What's, See, what's, now what's you're happened to now me? Now you're telling me that my reality what, what is wrong because my reality is not true. No, I didn't say that. I didn't say that, that your reality was wrong at all. I'm just saying what I said, I, I, I'm giving you from experiences. My feeling that I'm getting from Sergeant, Sergeant Stevens is he's telling me that his reality is the only reality and that my reality is wrong. That what I'm saying, I am blind. That was the term that was used. You are blind if you can't see that. And to me, he's telling me, that tells me, you're wrong, I'm right. And I'm never going to tell Sergeant Stevens he's wrong. I, I believe what he says. Did I tell you you was wrong? You told me I was blind. What's the difference? I am telling you you're blind if you don't know that this is going on in the world. I don't see it the way you see it. I see, I know it's going on, but I don't see it the way you well, see you it. Well, you, 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 you didn't say it. 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 I should have been allowed to tell you that. Excuse me. I think that's the first Throughout Group 1's storming, Petty Officer Anderson has tried to lend a voice of moderation to the debate. He doesn't want to be lumped with his frustrated white male classmates. I thought I was putting a very defensive position. Say hey, what I mean. I thought, um... Racism was on a downturn, going away. And to think that that still exists and is that prevalent, it's kind of scary, but... The whole... But on the day trainer Efren Al Cairo turns the discussion to the relationship between blacks and white liberals, it's Anderson's turn on the hot seat. Uh, to me, the white liberals go either way. Uh, uh, now what I see is the white liberals going on well is uh, beneficial to them. Is, is that yeah. What, what I, I, they get something out of it there. Yeah. But the moment that things get, uh, times get hard or something like that. Uh, they turn it back. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's ironic. I've, I've heard that same thing about, about blacks. But it, when <laughs> times get hard, they turn oh, yeah. it back. Oh, yeah. Blood's thicker than water. You ever heard that? I've heard the same thing about white. Yeah. Well, you hear well, you, you, you know, you're, you're bringing that out, and I'm like, that's exactly what I'm hearing. It's exactly the same thing, but... I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to get a definition. Somebody give me a definition of white liberal. Certainly, Justin, my... I didn't have a de definition of white liberal. I was just interested to know from Petty Officer Anderson uh, today, he say, I've heard that about blacks, and uh, when we had the thing up on the board... Didn't say a word. Was there any particular reason that you didn't put that up there? That yeah, because it wasn't brought to my mind. Oh, okay. This, this right now just reminded me. Okay. You think you have a baptist because you're white? 
Do I use an advantage? No. Do, you do I have an advantage? You I don't know. I'm being told that I am. But do you think you, you got an OS on your sleeve there? You think you got that because, you know? Because I'm white? No. no. How come me? What do we say? I am a. I cannot be, you know. Always. Hello. That's why I'm so lucky because I grew up in Utah. You have a good education. You oh, I'm lucky because I grew up in Utah. Because, right. because my, my ancestors were chased the hell out of Missouri. So I'm lucky? No. You didn't. Because now I have a good education. <laughs> you have a better education than. Sergeant yeah, I got, a, I got a good education because this white society that you're telling me about chased my ancestors the hell out of Missouri and out of Illinois. So I got a, all right, in that case, I'm fine. Well, I got a good one, education. Do you think, New York? my question is, do you think you have an advantage because of that? Being, getting a good oh, education? Because I, yeah, okay, I, yeah, I, I can thank the white society for chasing my ancestors out of Missouri, no, no. out to Utah, so I could get you a, a, a better education than Sergeant Gilbert. You always exaggerate. Are you going to have But that's the point. Do, do I have, a, do I have an advantage? In my, in my, in my, in my uh, experience as a recruiter, I've seen a lot of minorities who cannot pass the test. Yeah, there is a possibility that I have some kind of advantage over, Thank you very much. over yeah, someone else. Simply because... All the minority males are more or less laying a guilt trip on him and he's falling for it. And, you know, I would think that because of his unique experience, because of his unique outlook, he would be able to deal with it on his own terms. But apparently, uh, he's having a hard time being there. I, one, one point that you're, you're pushing to the side. Who's to say that if I were in the same situation, in the same school with Sergeant Gilbert, and I went down the recruiting station and took that exam, who's to say I still wouldn't get a better score? But my, my question because is... Because I studied harder or whatever. No, no, so my friend, that's Gilbert. Sergeant Gilbert has a chance to go to yeah. school. That's when you have a chance to go to your school. Well, didn't fix to where you came from. No, the, the, an individual going to the same school as whether it be white, minority, whatever, two people going to the same school. One goes down there, takes the exam. Another one, you know, one scores higher, obviously that's going to happen. Who studied harder? Who knows how to study? That's right. Oh, but it's the same school. Oh, but it's the it same does, education oh, wait, process. But it does, does it matter? Because you keep hopping on your ancestors were were pushed out of Missouri or wherever into Utah. Mm -hmm. My ancestors weren't even allowed to go to school. Wherever you went, Utah or Missouri, could you still not get an education? Yes. Because of your skin color. Did you not have an advantage? No, because, Wait, hold on a second, you, my ancestors set up their own school, so why didn't your ancestors set up the schools? That's right, we weren't allowed. Why? 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 You weren't allowed to. What's that? Why? Because this was about the same time, if I remember right, if my dates are about the right, about right. 1812. Yeah, that's when exactly. the warnings were kicked out of the United States. And what happened in 1866? Anderson seems disoriented also, by the okay. challenge from Group 1's minorities. He voices what had been a subconscious thought. We made it, why can't you? Johnson is stunned to suddenly see this other side of a white friend. Even though I, I can empathize with, uh, with different cultures and races, um, right, when it gets right down to it, I am white. Uh, I don't regret that at all. Um, and we're not all exactly the same. The final scene plays out like a parable for the strained relations between blacks and some former white allies in America today. I need to tell you, Sergeant Johnson, the history, about the same time blacks were around to start being educated and getting educated, it's about the same time the Mormons started educating their own out in Utah. Two years difference. <laughs> Actually, Actually, only about one year difference by the time the first group got out to Utah. Okay. Is there a question for me? Just so that you can go there. All right. I felt like uh, Petty Officer Anderson had just left me. I felt like he left me stranded. 
you know, not because he was black or white or anything. But I said to myself, what do you expect? And when I stood up after the group was over, uh, so I told Sergeant Bickley, I don't want you to tell me I told you so. Because, you know, he said, you know, I said, I really like Anderson. I trust him. And he said, okay, you haven't known him long enough. And I said, oh, no, I know. I'm a good judge of character. But when that happened, I just felt, ugh. A variety of jobs, I finally ended up working for Tirox Corporation, where I was placed in the personnel department and I had responsibility for hiring. But what happened? The government came down with this so called affirmative action order, which told me as an individual that I had to hire a certain number of minorities and women to work in my organization. That turned me off. After well, more than 10 weeks of training at the Army, the class should be ready to deal calmly with anyone. Then along comes guest speaker, Ted Payne. I don't want to an answer from you. Racism. Someone have a definition of that word. My thinking is, and I know you may be quote offended by this, but that's going to be a problem you'll have to deal with it. I find that most minorities get off on those issues, okay? And they do already, in a sense, have that kind of information. So I tend to listen to people who are more like myself. <laughs> now, wait a minute. That's, that's an assumption. That is not racism. That is not racism. When you say something, you turn it against us. I don't know that you turn it against us. My perception yeah. is my reality. Yeah, that's your reality. Oh, that's your reality. Right. Or my reality. Or my perception. No matter what well, see, sometimes when you people get into that stuff, uh, you act out a lot of that same behavior. Okay. All right? A lot of that same behavior, but you want to call us the racist. Or well, could you clarify what you meant by uh, you people? If you have a problem with you people, you have the problem. But I used to be manipulated by that. See, I'm going to talk the way I talk. I don't want people telling me how I should talk. If you have a problem with you people, you have a problem. Pain yes. presses all the buttons of intolerance, attacking affirmative action, belittling the role of women in the military, even challenging the manhood of reservists. Allow me to express myself. Last week, I buried reservists from the 14th Quartermaster. They were both men and women, and they were there defending your right to spill the bills you're pumping out here today. Are you saying my points of view, I have no right to them? No, sir. There's no validity to them? No, sir. I'm saying that there are others, and there's a whole world of people that share. And there's a here that want to say what I want to say, but cannot say it, because you see each other tomorrow. And I look at myself as a spokesperson for those who cannot speak out as openly as I can. You don't want to. You they tell me that some men that join the Navy they have more female hormones than male hormones. The, the, the students female. constantly interrupt Payne's diatribe with passionate rebuttal and finally drive him from the room. And you can bet that I'm going to the newspaper about this school because I think you create more conflict here than resolve conflict. When you get out of here, when you leave this school, I guarantee you, you're going to run into people with the same views that he had. And I tell you what else he said. He did say one thing that I thought was true. He said that there were people in there just like him that were intimidated by the fact that there were minorities, a lot of minorities in this school, in that auditorium, and they were afraid to express those views. So I was to said something when we left the classroom, you know. He said, uh, that's my kind of guy. Okay. And your perception was that that's how I... Really All felt. I could go on with the behavior you displayed. You said, that was my kind of guy. I've got a method for my madness, too. I was being facetious, right? And knew I would get a response from you, exactly no. what you said. No, you did Yes, I did. No, and that's didn't. why I said it. That is exactly the reason That's I why said you attack me right I'm now. Not, I'm, I'm just making yeah. my point. That's exactly why I said it. You said it several times. And he said it to other people outside the group. Mm -hmm. So it was not for a reaction from oh, yes, it was. myself. What about the people in the other group? Was it for the same reaction? I'm not even sitting in a group with them. They they can confront me later but if they got a pair. But why would you say it to them? They ain't got a pair. I ain't got no use for them. Why would you say it to them? So why you got to use Was it a me? method? Did, yeah. I mean, are you going to interact with them in group? It don't matter. Why did you say it to them? Because I felt like saying I wanted okay. to see what kind of reaction I, mean, I would get from them. Do I have to explain? Right. Do I have to explain to you? The man that was speaking had something to say, something that we've all heard before, and wasn't afraid because of whatever 
because of how someone would feel or take it. He was not afraid to say what he wanted to say. And that's what I liked about how he was saying it. It might not have been what he was saying, but the guy had a pair of balls, and he wasn't afraid to stand up and talk the way that he wanted to. But as we go back through the processing, you never express that's me things. sir really. Really, I don't have to live up to your expectations you don't have to live up to my expectations okay. I tell you what I want you to know I, I tell you what I want you to know okay that's be just it's, like I was talking to instructor I think is just because Sergeant Hustleton wanted to listen to him doesn't necessarily mean he's agreeing that's right I, I want maybe to he just wanted to listen to this so get talk. I already told you that I, I didn't agree with everything that he said but every I, I agree that everything he said has already been stated and it's everything that everyone in this class right now knows for a fact but we're afraid to deal with the reality of it in okay. society. And that's why everyone that did get up and cried and said, well, you're picking on me, and, and the little giggly laughs, okay. that's, that, that was overgeneralized. Okay. They took it as personal attacks on them. And I wanted to find out what, the met, what his badness to his methods were. I, I, why did he say it? And I was deprived of that chance. And like I said, I didn't care if he's green, black, blue, purple, it don't matter. I feel hurt that you don't want to hear what I had to say. When did you interrupt me when I was talking to you? And you got all, you know, <laughs> yeah. I feel hurt now. I was expressing my, my point. But you, but you want to hear what he had to say, but then still when we got to hear you, you want to hear what I had to say. The real him was coming out in that, you know. He also nothing, said nothing was to do with what he said. But he said he was, he was just guiding people because he knew how people would react to it. But I don't think, you know, you can always cover it up with that by saying that. I kind of think the real sign also maybe was coming out then. All right, I'm back at your request. Reluctantly, a few hours later, they invite pain back. But you know, it is a beautiful thing to see, to see people unite together to attack a common enemy. Now, that's not to say I didn't see some people say, aha, it's my kind of person. Finally got him here. He reveals that it was I all a psychodrama, want to get an here. act, We're searching for ways and he has one more surprise in store for them. Maybe I better give you something to go back in your groups with. Uh, Let's see, what, what is your title? Chief Johnson. Chief Johnson, could you stand up here? What if T Chief Johnson was brought in here this morning in my civilian clothes, and his name was Ted Payne now, and he got into his psychodrama talking about his experiences in the Ku Klux Klan? He wouldn't have the credibility, right? Why not? Because of his color. Oh, because of his color. You know what's interesting? I've been using my physical appearance as an educational tool, a psychological tool, to point out the myth of race and the impact of color in this society. Because under that myth called race, I'm classified as black, and I am black. Both of my parents are black. Both sets of my grandparents are black. I'm also married to a woman that is black. And I have five children of various shades and color. I was not left on the doorstep. I wasn't adopted, and the milkman didn't come in. Thank you. You can go ahead. I don't even know how many people hear it when I see it. See, I never stood up and told the audience I'm white and I'm here to talk to you today. The whole audience made certain assumptions about me, see. Ted Payne is not his real name, but the rest is authentic. He is an African American who looks white. Uh, you know, my ethnic identity. These are his parents. This is his wife and the rest of his family. His life and career pose the ultimate question why do we care about the color of our skin? I always wonder what would happen if uh, President Bush called the news conference and said, oh, by the way, I'm black. I wonder what the reaction from the country would be. Or better yet, what if we turn the all the same color? If we can do that. I tend to think that if we were able to do those things, turn to the same color, turn to the same gender, I wonder what issues we would be dealing with today. What do you think? Well, somebody might stand up tomorrow and say, I'm six foot six, you're only five three, and we gotta work on the issues of heightism in the society and its impact. You know, it's part of being human, whoever we are. You know, I don't know why we we think or do that, you know, do those kinds of things, but uh, it's part of the reality of uh, what we're about as human beings. The 
it's just been a hard subject for people to talk about. And it ain't been talked about a whole lot until now. I haven't seen it talk, talked about that much until I got here. And I'm, I'm glad, you know, because I've learned a lot, and I'm sure a lot of other people learn a lot of things, too. After three months, Group One gathers for the last time. We spent a lot of time together. They've met in this small room for a total of some 200 hours. Sir, thank you, sir. <laughs> Did they learn anything? <laughs> sir, Stevens, I want to thank you for showing me something that I didn't know. You know what I mean? I think I, I know more, I think I see more than I did uh, 12 weeks ago. I don't know if I'm a different person, but uh, I know I see more. I mean, just watching TV, you can you pick out things. A black man whose car had been stopped by Los Angeles police officers was in the street. That incident showed me that, that things were still going on. I was saying a lot of things, you know, it wasn't, wasn't there, that there wasn't a problem there. And then I see things like that, and then I see that maybe there is a problem. Maybe, maybe things like that still do exist. Uh, maybe sometime again we get to serve together here. Then if you I realize now, after the small group, what makes me tick, <laughs> and am I racist or not, and my little idiosyncrasies I have against people yeah, and stuff, and how to control those. I also learn from other people, you know, some people have problems realizing what actually is going on and what has happened in the past. They think everything is hunky-dory, and it's really not that way. In the end, Sergeant Hustleton is still the enigma. Was Ted Payne really his kind of guy? He avoided our questions on that subject, but the only officials feel Hustleton did contribute by sharpening the debate. We get some people that say, well, you can't teach me anything. I'm not going to change. Nothing you're going to tell me is going to change my ideas or beliefs. I don't believe that. You know, I had that opinion when I came through here 19 years ago as a student. I thought I, I knew everything, and I learned a whole lot. For Sergeant Johnson and Petty Officer Anderson, it is a somber farewell. I really do value your opinion. At the expense of a friendship, Anderson discovered something about his deepest feelings. For me... There are some prejudice that I have that I didn't realize that I had. Um, and then, you know, that's not to say that's bad, it's because I really don't think that I've acted on this prejudice for the, uh, and caused discrimination, but, but at least now I know that it's there. Okay, that's the Anderson. We had a rocky road. Yeah, we had. <laughs> <laughs> when you read this letter, you'll see how I feel. But um, I learned a lot from you. Do you think he's a racist? Do I think he's a racist? Yes. There's a weary, almost empty feeling at the end. What happened here, when whites and blacks met in one room, was as tough as many battles and just as important. The openness has got to come. Um, I think all of the dialogue and all of the academic knowledge in the world is not going to take the place of that personal interaction that goes on between people that brings about a better understanding. Graduation day. These newly trained equal opportunity advisors will soon return to their units. Their instructors seem pleased with this first class of 1991. If I take anything away, it's a, it's a sense of satisfaction that we have prepared this group of folks to go out in the field and do a good job for commanders and ensuring that people are going to get fair and equitable treatment. One more question lingers at the end. Could the rest of society emulate this program? And should we? If we can do it within the military structure, then folks outside of the military structure can do it just as easily. As, as we can. It's tough because people don't like to open up. You know, people don't like to deal with issues of prejudice and discrimination and racism and sexism because they're sensitive, emotion-packed, you know, kind of gut-wrenching issues. Petty officer first These issues cannot be resolved in a few months. 
Group one certainly didn't emerge as one big happy family. Their days together were as chilling as they were rewarding. But that's not the point. The point is that here, in a rare instance, people are trying to deal openly with a subject that most of us, at great cost, avoid. Even if you change a racist one thought, one of his uh, stereotypes, it's better than not changing any at all. Sergeant First Class Eugene Bickley, United States Army. It probably won't change in my lifetime. It may not even change in my kids' lifetime. But eventually it has to change. Because then we're headed for destruction. Racism is everywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Class 91 1. is provided by the financial support of viewers like you and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Frontline is produced for the Documentary Consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. <laughs>